Okay, we're up to question six now on the January 2009 BY1 paper. Uh, this question is about enzyme inhibition. And the examiner's drawn two diagrams there uh, to represent the two different types of inhibition. Just to remind you that this part here is the active site of the enzyme. Okay, and there you have the two different types uh, of inhibitor. Okay, so the examiner wants to know uh, the type of inhibition showed by uh, A and B. Well, if we go up to A, um, you can see that the inhibitor has a similar shape there to the active site. Uh, it's not complementary to the active site, but it is similar because it could actually fit uh, into that region there of the active site. Okay, um, so this type of inhibition is the competitive inhibition. And the inhibitor, of course, is a competitive inhibitor. All right. Um, if we scroll down to part B there, uh, the inhibitor in this case um, is drawn as a circle. And that is obviously a very, very different shape to that of the active site. Um, and the inhibitor is actually bound to the enzyme um, at a site that's not the active site. OK, so that type of inhibitor there would be a uh, non-competitive inhibitor. OK, so uh, the answers to A and B then. A is a competitive inhibitor and B is a non-competitive inhibitor. OK, that's done. Uh, let's move on to part uh, two. Uh, it's asking what type of inhibition, A or B, would be decreased by increase in the concentration of substrate. Now, um, the biology behind this question is quite important uh, to understand. Um, I've tackled it in the notes. Okay, um, It's beyond the scope of this uh, video tutorial to fully explain um, what's going on with uh, this question. But I will attempt um, to help you understand it by using a graph uh, in a moment. Um, OK, but uh, this type of question has come up quite frequently uh, in inhibition questions. Um, so it's asking what type of inhibition A or B would be decreased by increasing the concentration of substrate. So another way of looking at it is what inhibition is affected by the concentration of substrate. So just remember that the substrate has to bind to the active site um, and so does a competitive inhibitor. All right. So it's actually the competitive uh, inhibition that would decrease if the concentration of substrate was increased. OK. Um, so that's the actual answer to the question. It's actually um, inhibition A, which is the com competitive inhibitor. All right. So let's type that in, and then I'll 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 help um, explain what's going on there. Okay, then. So I've typed in the answer A. Um, if I just uh, flick over to this uh, little sketch of a graph I've drawn. Okay, it's a bit a bit rough graph, but. Uh, It'll do uh, for this brief uh, explanation I'm going to give uh, to why um, increasing the substrate concentration reduces or decreases the effect of a com competitive inhibitor. OK, um, so in any work on uh, enzyme inhibitors, uh, your graph always has substrate concentration along the x-axis and rate of reaction along the y. Okay. Now I've drawn three lines on this graph. Uh, the black line represents the uh, rate of reaction where there is no competitive inhibitor. Uh, the red line represents the rate of reaction when you have added a com com competitive inhibitor. And the blue line uh, is one I'll come to uh, in a moment. OK, um, right, let's talk a little bit about the gradients of the black and the red line. Um, the black line has the uh, steepest gradient uh, at the start, OK, uh, which signifies it has the, the fastest rate of reaction, OK. Uh, the red line has a shallower 
uh, gradient because the compet comp competitive inhibitor has actually uh, reduced the rate. Okay, remember a comp competitive inhibitor um, reduces the chance of the substrate binding to the active site. All right, so if you get less substrate bind into the active site the actual rate of reaction will decrease okay so there's the two extremes there we've got uh, the black line with no inhibitor we've got the red line with a comp competitive inhibitor added um, now the blue line represents the rate of reaction where you have a comp competitive inhibitor added but we've added extra substrate in this case all right so the addition of more substrate molecules has actually raised the rate of reaction. That means it has reduced the effect of the inhibitor. All right. So the addition of more substrate molecules means that more substrate will bind to the active site. When that happens, the rate of reaction will increase. Okay, so the blue line has a slightly steeper gradient compared to the red line, uh, signifying that the rate of reaction has increased. The blue line doesn't have uh, the same steepness as the black line because remember there still is an inhibitor present um, as represented by the blue line. Okay, uh, so that was just a, a brief um description explanation of why a comp competitive inhibitor uh, is uh, reduced or the effects of the comp competitive inhibitor is reduced by the addition of more substrate uh, molecules right if we go back to um, the question we've already answered part two uh, if we go now to part b okay and this is looking at uh, immobilized enzymes and uh, we have a graph here that we have to uh, tackle. Okay, uh, the graph is rate of reaction in arbitrary units. Okay, arbitrary unit means uh, there's really no no real units to it. They're just made up units. Okay, and uh, we actually have temperature there along the uh, x-axis. Okay, so that graph is looking really at the effect of temperature on the rate of reaction of two types of enzyme. One immobilized enzyme, which is the dotted line, and the free enzyme, uh, which is obviously an enzyme that hasn't been immobilized. Okay, uh, so the examiner has told you that immobilized enzymes are enzymes, uh, enzyme molecules that are trapped on an inert matrix, such as a gel capsule. And the graph shows the effect of temperature on the maximum rate of reaction of the same enzyme in its free and in its immobilized state. So he's actually giving you some more information now. It's the same uh, enzyme, but in one reaction it's free, and in another reaction it's actually been immobilized. Okay, right. Uh, part one, we need to explain the rate of reaction at 5 degrees C and 70 degrees C for the free enzyme. Right, so in this part of the question, we're only concerned with the free enzyme. All right, so that means as we look at the graph, uh, we can ignore the dotted line. It's not relevant for this question. Okay, it's just the solid black line because that's the one that represents the free enzyme. Okay, uh, the only temperatures that we're interested in are 5 degrees C and 70 degrees C. Um, so where on earth is 5 degrees C on uh, the graph? Um, you can see that um, you have 10 small squares will give you 20 degrees C. Okay, um, so 5 degrees C would be, if I get my marker pen, if we count across 5 degrees C will be about there. There we go, about halfway. Okay, and the uh, 70 degree C mark will be uh, just about 
for there. Okay, and I mark in the five degree temperature again, which would be about there. Now, obviously, in an exam, you need to accurately locate um, the temperatures there. Okay, um, so uh, easy way to find it. Basically, each small square represents two degrees C. Okay, so I've just counted along uh, five degrees. So it's it's two and a half uh, small squares will give us five degrees C. Okay, um, <clears throat> right. So uh, explanation now of the rate of reaction at 5 degrees C. So the rate of reaction at 5 degrees C for the free enzyme is actually very, very low. All right. Now, word of warning, whenever you draw lines on a graph, you must use a ruler. OK, you have to draw them accurately. So I just quickly sketched in a line there to show that uh, the rate of reaction uh, is very, very low at 5 degrees C. So we've got to explain uh, that away, OK? And the answer is simple. At low temperatures, there is uh, less kinetic energy, OK? So that means the enzyme and the substrate have less kinetic energy, they collide less, um, they produce fewer or lower enzyme substrate complexes and that actually then gives us the low rate uh, of reaction so let's type that in okay so the answer i've put is uh, the kinetic energy is low so there are fewer collisions between the enzyme and substrate right at uh, 70 degrees c um, the rate of reaction for the free enzyme is actually at zero Okay, or almost at zero. Okay, um, that's seventy degrees there. So there's there's a very very slight rate of reaction there. Okay, uh, but why is it so so, so low? All right, um, the answer to that is related to the enzyme structure and uh, the very very high temperature that the enzyme is being subjected to. Okay. So uh, the temperature is 70 degrees C. The rate of reaction is almost zero. Uh, why? It's straightforward. The enzyme has been denatured. Okay, the temperature is so high um, that all the bonds that maintain the three-dimensional tertiary structure of the enzyme have been broken. The hydrogen bonds are broken. Maybe the disulfide bonds have been broken. Okay, so when that happens, when the enzyme has been denatured, the active site has also been denatured, its shape has been destroyed, um, so its shape is no longer complementary um, to the substrate. And if the substrate cannot bind to the active site, uh, then you actually get a very, very low uh, or even uh, no rate uh, of reaction. So uh, a little tip for you, when, uh, when you're discussing enzymes in an exam, you do have to remember your protein structure because um, the functioning of enzymes um, is ultimately related to its structure. OK, so protein structure is essential to understand for enzyme work here. Right, let's type that answer in. OK, so uh, that's my answer. The enzyme active site has been denatured due to the high kinetic energy breaking uh, the hydrogen bonds. Uh, remember the hydrogen bonds are, are weak bonds uh, so they are uh, particularly prone uh, to being broken by high temperatures uh, basically because of the, the high kinetic energy the whole protein molecule vibrates so violently uh, that these bonds in particular do actually break once that happens, the enzyme denatures and uh, is no longer functional. Remember, uh, protein uh, denaturing is a permanent uh, process. The enzyme uh, cannot uh, function after it's been denatured. Okay, then, uh, let's move on um, to part two. Um, we're asked to describe three differences between the effects of temperature on the immobilized and the free enzyme. So in this question now, we do have to consider both the lines on the graph um, and look at 
uh, the differences between the effects of the temperature uh, on the two types of enzyme. Okay, so we're going to move up uh, to the graph again. We're going to uh, try and describe now three differences um, between the uh, the two types of uh, enzyme. Okay, so there's the graph. Now, um, let's let's start with the with the most obvious ones, really. Okay, uh, let's start to look at uh, sort of this region of the graph here for a moment. Okay, uh, there are some very there's obvious differences. Uh, between the immobilized and free enzyme down here. Okay, what this region down here represents is where the enzyme has been completely denatured. All right. So if you look at the solid line, um, the free enzyme has been denatured at, at around 70 degrees C, just just very slightly uh, above 70. It's been completely denatured. But if you look at the free enzyme, sorry, the immobilized enzyme that denatures at uh, about 10 degrees higher, uh, at 80 degrees. So that's one obvious difference between uh, the two enzymes and uh, the effect of temperature. Okay, uh, so, so one answer there would be relating to the, uh, the temperature at which the enzymes become denatured. Okay, um, another um, pretty obvious um, difference really is to do with the uh, optimum temperature. Uh, remember, an optimum temperature is the temperature at which the enzyme reaches its maximum rate. Okay, um, so if you have a look at the um, immobilized uh, enzyme, um, the optimum temperature really uh, is quite broad. Okay, um, compare that to the free enzyme, it has a far narrower uh, optimum temperature range. Okay, um, so we're looking, uh, if I can just uh, draw uh, a bit of a line on here, sort of the optimum temperature for the immobilized enzyme is from around 40, it reaches its peak at 40. Um, and it goes over, ooh, I would say, uh, to about 50, something like that. Okay. All right. So there's quite a, a broad range there of the, uh, of the maximum optimum temperature. Okay. Um, another uh, obvious feature, really, if we, if we look at the graph as a whole, um, the immobilized enzyme um, really it, if you look at the sort of the left hand side of the graph first um, uh, this side of the graph the the dotted line has a, has a steeper gradient uh, compared to the uh, the black line so that signifies that the actual rate of reaction of the immobilized enzyme is higher than that of, uh, of the free enzyme okay um, so that would be another obvious difference between um, the effect of temperature on the two uh, types of enzyme. Right. Okay, when uh, uh, making descriptions from graphs, uh, you do need to actually state uh, some values off the graph. So as, as you can see, I've drawn some quick lines on the graph a moment ago to uh, be able to read off some temperature uh, value. So we need to incorporate those uh, into our um, answers. Uh, so if we scroll down now to the um, uh, part two, we can actually type these answers in. Okay, I've typed in the answers then for part two. Uh, first one, I've said the free enzyme is completely denatured at 70 degrees C, while the immobilized enzyme is completely denatured at 80 degrees C. So there I've actually quoted temperature values from the graph, which is essential uh, for uh, describing graphs. The second one, I've said the optimum temperature for the immobilized enzyme cover a wider range. So that's from 40 to uh, uh, 50 degrees C. Okay, just down there. Um, 
Okay, and the last one I've said the rate of reaction for the immobilized enzyme was greater from 0 to 40 degrees C. Okay, um, so there's three um, obvious, obvious differences then between the two types of enzymes um, with regard to temperature. Okay, then let's move on to part three. Uh, suggest how trapping the enzyme in an inert matrix can help explain the differences you have described in part B2. Well, the trapping of an enzyme in the inert matrix, which is the uh, a way of immobilizing an enzyme, um, it actually stabilizes the three-dimensional structure of an enzyme. Okay, so if you've immobilized um, an enzyme in an aldermate bead, for example, all that gel is acting as a support um, and a uh, scaffold, if you like, to support and maintain uh, the structure of the enzyme. It, uh, it sort of stabilizes the enzyme. Um, so basically, if um, you increase the temperature of uh, an enzyme that's been immobilized, um, it can withstand that temperature a lot more before it becomes denatured. Okay, so you don't get the bond breaking within the protein structure because everything's been stabilized by the uh, the inert matrix. Okay, so uh, that's the answer to part uh, three. Okay, so there's the answer typed in. Uh, the 3D structure of the enzyme is maintained or stabilized, uh, so there is less molecular movements. Okay, right. Uh, lastly then, uh, for one mark, describe one use of immobilized enzymes uh, in medicine. Uh, the classic one to write in there, of course, is for the uh, detection of uh, blood sugar. Okay. Um, you uh, could have mentioned um, other uh, uses, but I think the best one there is the uh, detection of blood uh, glucose levels. Uh, of course, you can uh, measure levels of uh, various things in urine as well okay but the the blood glucose one is fine right so that completes uh, question six all right the total marks available there were uh, 10 a uh, little bit more uh, involved this question okay uh, it starts off quite easy um, with parts one and two uh, but uh, you know you really have to know your stuff to tackle the uh, graph question there um, lastly then of course uh, uh, this uh, part three um, I have mentioned in my notes about uh, the uh, immobilized enzymes uh, structure being stabilized but again you either know the answer to that or you don't and it just emphasizes that you do need to thoroughly uh, revise your work okay because um, you don't want to be losing uh, losing any marks really in these exams right if I uh, pull up the mark scheme uh, for question six just for you to have a look at it um, obviously uh, there are other uh, possible answers mentioned in the mark scheme okay so this is your opportunity to have uh, a little look at the mark scheme okay uh, so if I scroll down a bit more there's part two. Okay, so there's a couple more options um, for part two in the mark scheme, which I haven't uh, mentioned. Um, and then the last two questions there. Um, uh, and that completes uh, question six.